Other people's guides were like hugging them and oh well done, you've done it. But my guide was like, mate, no, you can cry later. Let's go do what we need to do and go because it's not safe. My right foot landed on the bank and my left foot went straight down. And I fell into the crevasse. I was on the safety line. I must have fallen about five to 10 feet. And I was just hanging there, looking up into the sky and just, just, just waiting for them to pull me back up. My name is Aki Rahman. I'm an adventurer and I summited Mount Everest in 21 days whilst fasting for Ramadan. I was born in Bangladesh in a town called Silet and I moved to the UK when I was 18 months old. I was always competitive and I felt like, I didn't feel like I needed to prove anything to anybody but I just wanted to be the best at everything that I did. When I was in secondary school and I just realised I was really good at athletics. I used to run 100 metres really fast and I was good at triple jump. I became the champion of uh, triple jump for intermediate boys at the age of 14. The climbing bug had been inside me since I was a kid. Back in the days when I was growing up, we didn't have YouTube or, you know, internet like we do now. And I used to wait for programs to come on Everest. And I used to think, oh, those guys are heroes. Maybe one day I could climb Everest. And that was it. I never thought about it ever again. Uh, until like a few years ago, me and my friend, we always went on talking about climbing mountains. And then every year we used to talk about it, get really excited and then go home and forget about it. A few years ago, I remember him talking about it with me and we both got excited. And I remember going home and thinking I'm gonna forget about it. Guess what? He calls me up and he goes, mate, we're going on that day. If we don't bloody go, we're never gonna go. I got really excited. I started looking at YouTube videos, at what the trail looks like, you know, on, on, on uh, Mount Snowden. That's the first one that we're gonna climb. And I wanted to check the trail that we were gonna take and how it looks. And then you know how you have like these videos that they suggest. And then I was looking at, uh, Snowden videos and Ben Nevis videos and then it went on to like El Bruce and all the mountains and even to Everest. My first climb on El Bruce wasn't actually a success. I had to abandon the climb um, due to storms coming in. I, I looked at my phone and I could, I could, I saw the forecast and I could see the storms coming in. And I'm like to the group like, let's go, let's go today, let's go today, I can do it, I can do it. But they said, no, 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 you're acclimatizing, you can't do it today. And I felt a bit disappointed because I knew that the storms were coming in and we weren't going to be able to do it. Um, so we ended up going off the mountain and I actually paid a guide to try and take me up and we tried to battle the winds and the storm to, to get to the summit, but it didn't work. So I came home deflated, distraught, probably depressed a little bit. Um, but I managed to raise enough money to build 10 water wells in Bangladesh. That was my first ever charity project. I started, you know, a different campaign and I climbed Kilimanjaro in uh, I think it was July and then I went straight to Mont Blanc and I climbed that in a day. Um, essentially I climbed two mountains in two continents like within seven days um, and when I got back uh, from those two uh, I realized that uh, Russia had opened its borders. I landed in Russia with two days and the third day by 12 o'clock and I'd have to be out of Russia because my visa would expire. So I'm planning it with my guide. We plan to do it in two days if not We've got the third day to fall back on, but I'd have to be out of the country by 12 midnight. And I said to him, look, it's going to be difficult whether we do it in two days or three days. Let's do it in a day. And that's when he threw a fit. It's like, okay, it's impossible. We can't do this. I did it in two days with oxygen mask. And those guys struggled. And you know, you're saying one day, what you're saying is almost impossible anyway. And now you're saying you want to do it in a day. And I said to him, look, Dennis, calm down. We've got two days, possibly three days. We'll try it in a day. If not, we've got these other days to fall back on. Let's just give it a go. I knew I could do it, so. <laughs> um, we went and it was done. When I landed in Lukla, which is like the gateway to Everest, um, it, took, it took eight days to trek to base camp. Um, so we had a couple of days in, in some places and then it was a night in every other place. Because I was fasting at the time, it was a little bit harder. In fact, it was a lot harder to be honest with you. I remember that first trek we went to, I think it was Pak Ding, and my throat was so dry. 
It felt like you can light a match on it. That's how dry it was and I was completely gone. Six months prior, I walked to Namche in a day and this time it took me three days because I was fasting. When I got to base camp, I had to wait three or four days um, just to get used to the atmosphere because I was at five and a half thousand meters and I think the oxygen is about 50% there. Um, so I'd have to wait and just get acclimatized. But it was just a case of waiting and what I did was every day just to keep myself going is I used to walk, you know, to Crampon Point, through the glacier a little bit, take some pictures and stuff, you know, social media it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it, it was difficult to wait because it gets a little bit boring at times. You know, it's not all about you know, fast action climbing is, you know, waiting around, waiting for the weather, waiting for, you know, uh, your body to adapt. So, yeah, it was, it, it was good. It was nice just to get, get, get to know the people around base camp, get to know my guides and my Sherpas and, you know, the other expedition members. High altitude chef, right? I wanted to spend the first part of Ramadan with my family because I knew I was going to miss them. Um, so I asked the company, can I extend it or can I summit later than the group. They agreed to it, but when I got to the mountain, the Sherpas, um, who are experienced and are on the mountain, they said to me, look, it's better we do it together as a group. Usually people do two rotations. I did one. So when we're at altitude, our bodies are thinking, oh, what the hell's going on here? There's not enough oxygen. We need to reproduce the hemoglobin in our body so that we can breathe better because that's what carries oxygen to our organs. We need to do that two times, usually on Everest once to camp two and then we come back all the way to base camp um, and then rest and recover once we're fully recovered then we're acclimated up to camp two so we go up to camp three on the second rotation and then we spend some time there and then we come back all the way to base camp and then we wait for uh, good weather or the date when we plan to go for the summit lakpa was my actual sherpa guide he was going to be with me all the way through. Purba man, Purba was my brother. Throughout my Everest climb, I was completely zapped all the way through it, yeah? <laughs> because I climbed it on one rotation and even though Lakpa was my guide, Purba, you know, was with me all the way through the first rotation and what happened is um, we got to camp two. We went through the, through the ice fall, really difficult, technically, it really hit me. The ice fall really shocked me, you know, because I thought, you know what, I'm fit, I'll do it, but it was so hard tried my best to get to camp three. I think I got, I was about 200 meters short, short. I got to the Lotsi wall, or the Lotsi face, and I said, that's it, I can't do anymore. Uh, I'm completely zapped. Um, I want to get back down. And when I come back, even if it is, if I don't get a second rotation, for the summit push, when I come back, I will push myself however I can to get to camp three. And when I get there, I know you'll give me oxygen, so I'll be all right, we'll take it from there. We went from camp, two to camp one and then we're going we're descending the ice fall and I remember um, coming to a crevasse and then there's some crevasses where we go over with ladders some we just hop over because they're so you know narrow and I remember coming to this crevasse and it was jumpable but I stood there scratching my head thinking the other side looks a little bit higher I don't think I'm gonna make it my right foot landed on the bank and my left foot went straight down and I fell into the crevasse. I was on the safety line. I must have fallen about five to 10 feet. And I was just hanging there, looking up into the sky, and just, just, just waiting for them to pull me back up. All the negative thoughts were going through my head. I had a vision of my youngest son just crying for some reason. And I just said to this, to, to Purba, I said, this isn't gonna happen, mate. Pull me out, Purba. Luckily by then, uh, a group of climbers came up and they threw another line and I used my ascender to come up. Um, but I must have been in there for about 40 minutes, you know. When I went down into base camp after I fell in, it was two days before Eid. I thought that, because I'm going to be at Everest, um, the excitement, the adrenaline, and everything's going to get me through. I won't miss my family. But I think those two things, missing my family and this little incident coupled together, put me in a rut. I was depressed. I stayed in my tent for two days. That's when Purba, the reason why I call him my brother, he came up into my tent and you know, he asked me what's up and I told him I miss my family. I was literally in tears. And he gave me a hug and said, don't worry about it. And these guys even went to the extent to bring food into my tent when I was you know, like too upset to go 
into the mess tent. And then on each day, I actually spoke to my family and my whole demeanor changed. She said, listen, you're there for a reason. Think about the people you're gonna help. Think about, you know, your goals and uh, you know, objectives. Um, and just do it and come home safe. And I became a different person. If you look at my videos in them two days, and then you look at my videos on that day, there's a massive contrast. In work, everyone uh, around the world who are celebrating and also the millions uh, at home in the UK celebrating Eid. Um, I just wanted to so wish you all a happy day and um, I'm going to be here in base camp spending, spending it alone um, it has been a bit you know hey guys I hope you're well inshallah I'm in base camp at the moment I've been here for about 10 days recovering been up and down the villages and um, we're going to go up tonight I remember on the final push for the summit um, obviously I'm excited uh, I'm looking forward to it and I feel as though I'm ready. I always knew I was ready, but it's just, you know, you don't know your body until you know it. And I've only been to 6,500, but now I've been to almost 7,000 meters. So I knew I could cope with it. So uh, I remember in particular in camp three, when I got there, uh, I was on oxygen. Um, I needed to eat something. And my guide brought me in like a bag of noodles. It looked like premium stuff. Uh, and I was looking forward to having it, but then when I opened it, I took one whiff and I was almost sick. And I just thought to myself, if I eat this, um, I might end up sick and I might be in a worse position than I am. So I'm not gonna eat anything. Uh, and I put my hand in my bag and I realized I got a multi-pack of Snickers. Um, and those were uh, frozen, thawed, frozen, thawed, you know, over the last 15 days and they were flat. Um, and I just thought, you know what, I'm still gonna have to have something. Uh, they've got nuts in it. Uh, high energy, high protein, so I, I had them and I remember I was in from 7,000 onwards and through the death zone for three days I was on two Snickers bars a day. The death zone is above 8,000 meters. Uh, camp 4 where we stay um, is just touching the death zone um, and the reason why it's called the death zone is because there's 29% oxygen there uh, in the air and the human body can't survive there. When I finally, I remember taking those last few steps and I, I knew I'd summited Mount Everest. Um, I was just elated and I felt like I've accomplished it and I felt so grateful. I made a prayer saying, thank you for bringing me to the summit, God. Um, just take me back down safely. I remember almost breaking down and my guide, who was like tough as nails, this guy said to me, listen, mate, there's no time to cry here. Let's go and take some pictures, have a drink and go. You can cry later. And he sort of put a stop to that. Other people's guides were like hugging them and you know, consoling them, oh, well done, you've done it. But my guy was like, mate, no, you can cry later. Let's go do what we need to do and go because it's not safe. We were probably there for about 20, 25 minutes, sat down, had a drink, took some pictures, and then we just made our way down. The weather's opened up. The hell is on its way. So I think we want to get off. <laughs> 